I have the honor of turning this program over to Drew Hirschfeld, who is performing the functions and duties of the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the USPTO, who will introduce our special guest for what I have no doubt will be a really inspiring conversation with someone who is a robotics rock star and an ambassador for encouraging young girls to get involved in STEM. And with that, Drew, over to you. Thank you very much, Kara, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome everybody to the Women's Entrepreneurship Symposium. Uh, this is one of our premier events, one of our most important events uh, that we have at the USPTO, so I'm thrilled to be a part of it. I'm thrilled to have you all here, and I'm thrilled that I'll be doing a fireside chat with uh, Dr. Amy Elliott, who I will read a bio in a second here. Um, I just want to thank the, the Women's Entrepreneurship team, uh, Kara and, and others, who put this event together because you do a great job. And I know uh, last year we literally had thousands of people at each of our WES events because uh, we put on multiple. And so um, just really, really phenomenal. It's wonderful to, to, to put this on. Uh, let me uh, talk about uh, Dr. Amy Elliott and give you some background. Uh, let me start by saying I had the pleasure of meeting her yesterday and I was so excited uh, after the discussion uh, that I hope you all have uh, as much fun as I did yesterday talking to her uh, as we have the fireside chat today. So uh, really just a, a, a great uh, role model and well-rounded background. So, so let me share some of the background with you. She's currently an R&D staff member at Oak Ridge National Laboratory Manufacturing uh, Demonstration Facility. Uh, her roles include uh, that she meets with industry from across the nation to consult with them on proper uh, application of 3D printing technologies. She conducts research in the area of inkjet-based metal and ceramic 3D printing. She holds a mechanical engineering degree from Tennessee Tech University and a PhD from Virginia Tech. She was cast on Discovery Channel's The Big Brain Theory, which is a reality show competition for engineers, where she placed second uh, out of 10 contestants. She uh, spends time filming as a science personality for the Science Channel's Outrageous Acts of Science, which explains the engineering and science behind viral video clips. Uh, she serves as an if-then ambassador for uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She's an inventor on numerous patents. Uh, so quite, quite a, a wonderful background. So thank you, Dr. Elliott. Uh, I'm gonna call you Amy, as uh, we agreed to yesterday from here forward. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. And um, there you are. I was, I was hoping you'd get your camera on. Let me start with uh, just a high-level question about STEM. How did you get your start into STEM? Yeah, so I wasn't one of those kids who grew up, you know, tearing things apart. Like I did, you know, help my dad out in the garage sometimes, but I just didn't have that, you know, I guess tendency. But my brother did, my older brother did, and he joined the robotics team in high school. And I didn't really know what that was, but all I knew is he got to go to Florida for the competition and I wanted to go to Florida. So I joined the team and then learned, oh, this is actually kind of fun. And the mentors there um, put me on some design tasks for the robot and I designed some parts of the robot and just seeing my like little paper dolls that I made, little paper mechanisms, made into metal, put on the robot and working. It just, it just clicked for me. I loved it. I fell in love, um, been in love ever since. And um, yeah, that was the rest is history. And I think you were on the, the first robotics um, uh, competition. Can you, can you discuss some of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we were team 547, uh, Falcon Engineering and Robotics had some great mentors and first robotics is just a great program. Um, it's an intense program, very, very intense. So when I was in it, it was a six week build time. So they'll give you, comp you know, the game rules, you know, beginning of January and you have six weeks to build a robot and ship it to the competition. Um, and so anyway, it was, it, was, it was a lot of fun. It was a blast. The best thing I did in high school, honestly, and set me on a path for mechanical engineering and lots of other opportunities as well. Great. Well, I have no doubt you made a comment earlier about, um, seeing your dad in the garage. And I have no doubt that, that, that your kids will say, and I know you have two boys, your kids will say, I saw mom in the garage. Um, and, and that's great. And you'll inspire others that, that people will watch their, their, their moms in the garage. And that note, 
you and I had a conversation yesterday. Um, I shared with you that that I met my wife in engineering school, um, and she was one only one of three females in the class. And you shared a similar experience. So can you share what what your experience was like being a female involved in STEM and and just what challenges you ran into? Yeah, sure. Um, it was actually mostly amazing, you know, and I actually didn't know I was I was the only girl in like most of my classes. And I didn't realize that until someone pointed it out. And I was just like, oh, oh, really? And then when you see another girl in your class, you're just like instantly best friends. Right. But um, if you're ever like single and, and you're going through engineering school as a woman, like you will not, you know, ever starve. You'll always have dates. Right. Like um, so there's this one time I was single for a bit and I had never really, you know, been single. I been, hadn't been in a long-term re- relationship. And so I didn't know like how dating works. So like I got all these dating requests and I was like, sure. Yeah, let's go. You know, and I ended up with like four dates in one night. Didn't think about it until it like came up to the day and I had to like call, but people be like, Hey, I'm like, really, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got like triple booked and I haven't dated before. I apologize. But uh, we have a saying, us girls in engineering, that um, the odds are good, right? Because, uh, you know, you have a lot of options for dating, but then the goods are odd because they're engineers, right? But um, that's kind of a joke because there's a lot of amazing guys in engineering, like Drew, right? <laughs> and like my husband, I married one of them. So, um, but yeah, it was, it was it was really fun. And, I, you know, I feel like, you know, I got along great with the guys. I really enjoyed having, you know, those friendships and that was it, you know, there really, there really wasn't a bunch of challenges for me. Honestly, it was, it was just all fun. Well, that's, that's, that's great to hear. And um, I think our goal, right, should be that, that the odds aren't that you get better dates, right? Or, 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 or there's an imbalance, right? Yeah. And so I, I, I really applaud you because I know you're, you're just a wonderful role model for people. And, and, and I have three daughters, they need role models and we all, and everyone needs role models. So, so I applaud uh, your efforts, by the way, I do have one of my daughters who, who uh, went to engineering school and they were about 40% female. So, nice. so things are, things are definitely going in, in the right direction. Um, I know we're somewhat limited in time and, and I want to make sure that I get to the reality show um, because it's not every day that you get to meet somebody or talk to somebody uh, who's participated in a real live reality show. So can you tell us how you ended up getting on the show and what that experience was like? Yeah, sure. So I've always, like, since I did first robotics in high school, I have just loved and craved being in the shop, building things with my hands out of metal. Um, and so, you know, through first I got, you know, the basics in, in uh, college, I did uh, Baja SAE where we learned to like cut, you know, steel and and weld and all that, you know, um, steel work, um, framing. And then in, uh, in college or also in college, I apprenticed a machinist and learned kind of that side of the shop. And so I was pretty well-rounded in terms of, uh, you know, fabrication. And so when the casting call came around, um, pretty much everywhere I went. So in grad school too, I was called MacGyver because I kind of knew how to fix like most things. (laughs) Um, and you know, maybe not well, MacGyver's not exactly a compliment all the time, but, um, you know, getting it work, getting it to work. Right. So anyway, the casting call came around and a bunch of people said, Hey, this is you, you need to apply. And they were looking for engineers, hands-on experience. Um, so I applied and they invited me to, you know, make a video and audition. And I went to the audition and, um, there was going to be a skills test. And I was just so so scared that they were going to make me weld aluminum, which I cannot do. I've never been able to do. It's it's a really hard skill to learn. And I just, I'm not, I don't know if I'll ever get it, but I was just worried. I was like, oh my gosh, they're, they've carted in a welder, uh, you know, a welder and they're going to make me weld aluminum. But it turns out the skills test was, um, they had just like disassembled a bunch of vacuum cleaners and we had to put them back together in a certain amount of time, like while talking and being personable. And I was like, oh, this is great. Because in high school, I worked at a Sears store and I had put together hundreds of vacuums. Like I could do this in my sleep. And so sometimes the universe smiles on you, you know. And so anyway, I knew I had it in the bag at that point. Um, But yeah, it was a great experience. Um, It was originally called Top Engineer. I would have never applied to a show called Big Brain Theory. But at the time, Big Bang Theory was popular. So they changed the name for that. But um, anyway, it was an amazing experience. And definitely once in a lifetime so I'm never doing that again it was super stressful <laughs> but yeah it was it was really fun 
can you tell us more, more about the show? So, so how, how did it, uh, how, how did it run? Like, I think you mentioned yesterday you were isolated for a while. Yeah. I think the audience would get a kick out of learning more about the show. Yeah. So, um, all these reality shows, they have to film in one go, right. From start to finish. And because, uh, it's a secret as to who wins, you know, you can't talk to anybody while you're filming. So they take your phone away. Like I could call my husband, uh, you know, twice a week for 15 minutes. And all I could talk about was the weather, you know, and like, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it's very hard for him, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, very intense. It was, um, I think, it, I think it was like seven weeks of filming and then there was eight episodes. So there's eight competitions and then 10 of us, um, 10 of us uh, competitors and I ended up getting second place, which was way better than I thought I would do. I went in there thinking, Oh my gosh, like the week before, honestly, I didn't tell you this yet, Drew, but the week before I was packing up my bags to head to LA for filming. I told my PhD advisor, I said, you know what? I can't do this. I'm not going, I'm going to make every female engineer look like an idiot. And cause I'm going to fail and it's going to be terrible. He's like, and this is, this is actually really profound. And this is something I like to tell um women that I mentor girls that I mentor is like he, he told me this and I'll never forget he said the guys aren't carrying their gender on their shoulders and neither should you and I was just like wow okay I can do this and so I went into the competition with the attitude it's like it's just me I'm not you know carrying my entire gender on my shoulders even though I still feel maybe in a little way I was but <laughs> um that really really helped me um get through the competition and and do my best and and it was a wild ride. I got second place, like I said, and um, uh, sec with second place came a hug from Buzz Aldrin, who was second man on the moon. Um, and he was so sweet. And he said that when he saw that I got second, he took me by the shoulders and he said, I know what it's like to live in the shadow of another. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, Buzz Aldrin just totally equated me to himself. And I was like, OK, I'll take second place for that any day. Like, I don't I don't need first. I don't need the prize money. I'll, I will take that. So um, very, very special experience. Well, that's wonderful. That sounds great. And, and like I said, you know, we all want to meet somebody who's been in a reality show, but we never get the chance to. So, so that's great to hear that. So you mentioned something uh, in your answer just now about um, mentoring uh, women and girls, and I would love to just learn more about what you do mentoring. Um, I'm a huge fan of mentoring. Um, Karen and I literally just got off of a, a mentoring event that we have at USPTO just before this. Um, and so I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts about what, well, what you do in mentoring and any advice you have to others to be mentors. Yeah, so I'm currently an official mentor through a program called Involve Me. Um, and they sign, they, they, you know, sync you up with girls who um, maybe have some challenges going through their STEM degrees and they, you know, uh, pair you up with um, someone who, you know, would make sense for you. Um, and then I obviously, I try to be a mentor to the the ladies around me who are um, up and coming in their careers um, at work. Um, and then, you know, try to do as many outreach activities as I can, and then, you know, kind of make contacts with, uh, with people that way. So yeah, I, um, I really enjoy mentoring. I've been, I've had so many amazing mentors that I have really you know, been there for me in very pivotal times. And I just, you know, want to give back and I really enjoy, I really enjoy getting to know um, other, other, other girls and, and their issues and, you know, giving them advice from, I got a lot of advice. I got a lot of opinions. I feel like I've, you know, been down many, many dead end roads and I would love to share with you, like how not to do things. So uh, save you some pain. That's, um, that's kind of where I come from in the mentoring space. So. Well, that's great. I don't think we can do enough mentoring, period, for everybody. And, and uh, it's wonderful that, that you're doing that. And lucky, lucky mentees who ha have you because you have such a, a wonderful background. I'm going to switch to um, some of the, the things you've worked on, right? And let me just ask you a very open-ended question about your projects. What, what's the favorite project that you work on? Um, so my favorite project, um, okay. So I might, I might have multiple answers for this, so, totally this, fine. This, <laughs> but, um, so I'll go back to the TV show, the big brain theory, because that was a, just a crazy experience. And we got to build things that like you would never build in real life. Um, one of them was this, uh, pancake machine and I love pancakes. I don't know how you feel about pancakes, but I really like pancakes. Like really like them. And so we ended up making a pancake machine, you know, to my chagrin. And it was this really cool um, machine where we had just a bunch of griddles and two layers. And like, we'd start cooking, you know, we'd have these dispensers that would, you know, drop the pancake batter 
on the first rack and then they flipping them over onto the second rack, took them on that and flip them over on the plates. And they had these syrup arms that came over and put syrup on them. And then like you could put like uh, chocolate chips and M&Ms and stuff at the top. And anyway, it was the most fabulous machine ever. It actually worked. And, like we made so many pancakes. We had like an hour to make as many, as much food as we could as part of the competition. And I still dream about that machine, you know, like in the middle of the night, I wake up thinking about that pancake machine. One day I'm going to build my own. It's going to be in my garage. and We're going to have a bunch of pancakes for the neighborhood or something, but absolutely one of my favorite projects ever. Um, but then like kind of on the nerdier side, um, another project that I like, it was actually my first patent with the U.S. Patent Trade, patent and trade Office, um, was at NASA. I worked there um, during college and at NASA Marshall Space, Space Flight Center in Huntsville. Um, Huntsville, Alabama, it's this really cool, interesting idea where um, let's say you needed to harvest uh, the energy from the sun, but you couldn't do it like electrically or something like maybe there was a lot, there's a lot of radiation, like you're on the moon or something. And so it's this mechanical um, reciprocating motor. So you have a shape memory wire, which um, is a wire that when you heat it up, it'll shrink. Um, and then when it cools off, you can stretch it back out. And so what the machine did was it had this like focusing um focusing lens type thing that would uh you put the wire in and then the, the sun would come and shine on it and make it shrink and as it shrank it had this like little blinker this like you know shade that would come over and let it cool and then it could stretch itself back out and then the shade would open and so it's this kind of like blinking mechanism and so that one was really interesting and like i remember um i was the intern so i was the only one who had time to like sit in the shop and like dial this thing in and so i made like all these like little tiny um, pieces that would go together and kind of screw and tune and like make these really, really tiny adjustments so that it would actually like hit the toggle point at the right spot. And so that was a really fun project because I got to like take a big piece of it for my own and got to spend a lot of time in the shop tinkering. I felt like a true inventor, you know, like a mad scientist. And it was really kind of, it was my first patent. So um, definitely holds a special place in my heart. That's great. And, and you, you, you anticipated my next question because I would have asked you about the patents. So thank you for, for, for addressing that. Um, but you also, um, you, you're mentioning a lot about hands-on. And I know yesterday you, you mentioned how important it is to you that you're involved in, in some hands-on work. And can you just explain your thoughts about that and why that is? Yeah, absolutely. So um, me, I, for me, being hands-on and getting to do hands-on things, building things by my, you know, with with my hands, not by myself, but you know, even with others, um, but just doing things with myself, with my own hands, um, it really has. It's it's very rewarding. Like for me, it's like I guess therapeutic. I don't know, but um, I really enjoy it. But then it also gives me like a good intuition as to like how things work and will things work and what's going to take to make something work. Like a lot of people who have never like built something that has to work like a robot or, a, you know, some kind of machine or anything really, um, they don't, you know, if you've not done that, you don't really understand how much it really does take to make something work. Like you can build something, but that's only like 50% of it. Like once you put it together, the other 50% is to get that all to work together, right? There's a bunch of debugging and lots of things that have to happen um, to make it work. So um, I really enjoy that. And then during college, like I did um, Baja SAE and NASA Moon Buggy and these hands-on, you know, little building competitions because it kind of gave, you know, when I was stuck in calculus class or I was you know, struggling with heat transfer, or these kind of really tough mathy classes, um, I could go to the shop that weekend and just kind of de-stress and, you know, it kind of refocused me and helped me see like, okay, this is what I'm doing this for is one day to build something cool, you know, with these, with these classes that I'm taking. Well, that's great. Thank you. And I know yesterday you mentioned to me about your garage. So, so in case, in case, you know, the audience can't figure this out, uh, Amy is very busy, likes to do a lot, but I learned that in your spare time, you like to use a 3D printer in your garage. So any, any thoughts you want to share about that? So I actually have um, a total of seven 3D printers in my, how many seven? That's seven. So, um, and one of them is one that me and my husband have been building together. Um, and it's a large, large, Printer. It's about a meter by meter by half a meter build volume. So like big, right? Like I'll build big stuff. Um, but it's been uh, ongoing. So the, the idea is I want to make a kit for a big printer that's under a thousand dollars. And um, my uh, my husband actually, I didn't tell Drew this earlier, but um, 
my husband uh, did the electronics for it. That's more his area than than mine. Um, he did the electronics as my push present for our first son, who is now two years old. <laughs> and since then, I've had about approximately five hours to touch that machine since we've had you know two children since then. Um, but that's the dream. And I've gotten, you know, I've printed a few things with it, but it needs some more tuning. But the other printers are like, you know, always going, making cool stuff. Like, um, I don't know if, uh, if you're, you'll announce, but there's a, a event in D.C. this weekend where they're showing our statues. Um, we can talk a little more about that later. But I've been trying to 3D print my own shoes for the event and failing miserably. But here's one of the shoes that I've been working on. It's actually way bigger. Like, my foot is not this big. I fully scaled it wrong. Um, but anyway, I've been working on that type of thing. And, um, yeah, I'm just, always, I'm just a 3d printing nerd, man. I do it at work. I do it at home. Like I'm always 3d printing stuff and, um, yeah, it's kind of my life. That's great. I love, I love that you show, you showed the shoes. Um, really, really wonderful. Um, so you mentioned the, the event this, this weekend. I'd love, I'd love for you to share that. That was actually going to be my next question. If then ambassador, first of all, congratulations to you yeah. on being yeah. um, uh, one of the statutes and an if then ambassador, but it would be great if you can explain what that means uh, to, to the audience. Yeah. So um, the if then ambassadorship is uh, sponsored by AAAS, American Association for Advancement of Science and also Lida Hill Philanthropies. And it's been a, a dream. It's, um, they selected 120 something of us women in STEM to serve as ambassadors. So we're, you know, designated role models for girls in STEM. And so they gave us social media coaching and some tips and, you know, just some things that can add to our STEM role model game. Um, and it was great. It's kind of like being on Oprah because we showed up to this, you know, the conference a couple years ago and they were just like, oh, we're going to do this for you. Oh, we're going to, by the way, we're going to 3D scan you and make you into a statue. Well, you know, like 3D print you into a statue. I'm like, well, I'm a 3D printing nerd. Now I can, you know, I can die happy now. Like if I die tomorrow, like, like what, what, how, how much cool, like there couldn't be anything more cool than that. Like for me, at least to be like 3D scan and 3D printed live, you know, full size. Um, and then, so we, we got that and then uh, they gave us, uh, you know, grant money, like a pretty, you know, nice size grant uh, pe- grant to do a project. So I've got a, a little kid's book that I've written um, about uh, energy because I work for Department of Energy. Um, but yeah, so this uh, this weekend that we're getting to go see our statues and my statue of me actually was when I was pregnant with my first son. Um, I've got the little one right here. So you can see my awesome <laughs> pregnant body. I'm just like, oh, great. Like, you know, the, the probably the the heaviest I've ever been is when they want a 3D scan me. But anyway, that was that was actually really cool. So me and my um, second son, who's six months old, will be at our statue this weekend. Um, and so technically, both of my boys will be in a picture. You know, we'll try to get everybody in, in that picture. So um, anyway, so that that's really exciting. It's just been a wild ride. It just keeps getting better and better. Um, I say it's like being on Oprah. Like it's like, oh, and you get a grant, and you get a statue, and there's just like more and more things that they're giving us, and it's just been so so amazing. And so I hope to get back as a role model um, and and make good use of those resources. And um, anyway, I think I'll be an ambassador for the rest of my life, even though technically the ambassadorship will end soon. But yeah, that's great, and I have no doubt you will do that. I'm sitting here trying. I've only you know talked to you yesterday when we first met, and today, but I feel like. Like I could, every time I would talk to you, I would learn more things that you do. It seems like you have 30, 40 hours in your day when the rest of us have 24. So that's quite, quite oh. remarkable. And by the way, on this, if then I will just say that, that, that my daughter, one of my daughters um, learned on this on her own and actually sent me uh, a picture of the statutes and said, dad, this really cool event is going on. So, so talking about being a role model, I will say it really works because one of my daughters no- noticed it then. Um, I know we have about uh, five or six minutes left. Can I turn to just maybe asking some advice, right? So, so let's start with what advice you might give to uh, a, a young you know, child starting off in STEM um, can be a girl, can be a boy either. So I'll leave it up to you, but love to hear what advice you would, you would give a young child considering a STEM field. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, anyone considering a STEM field is, you know, that's half the battle, right. Is just finding STEM. Um, like for me, I had no clue before, you know, my brother joined the robotics team and went to Florida. I had, you know, I would have never, never figured it out probably, or maybe too late. Um, because once you find it, it's like a gold mine. There are so many cool things in STEM that you can do. If you lose interest in one area, 
Um, there are a million other places you can go. And honestly, so many, so many um, professions use STEM. Um, and so that really anything you can think of, um, just think about like, you know, any, anything like nature, buildings, everything around us, there's some STEM build around it. So like, that's what I, I guess my biggest piece of advice would be if you find yourself losing interest, just go to a different STEM field because there's so much out there. If you like animals, there's a STEM field. You know, if you like climbing, you know, there's a STEM field for that, you know, in, in geology, right? Um, anyway, yeah. So just keep the excitement. Just keep going. Just keep, keep exploring. And um, you'll, find, you'll find something you're really passionate about in STEM. No, that's great. And, and it's, it's remark, your answer there is, and, and I hadn't asked you that question before, so I'm learning this uh, as we're talking. Your answer there is remarkably similar to what I tell people about intellectual property, um, is, is that it just covers so much and anything you can, can imagine or things you can't yet imagine are all covered. And so there's so many opportunities. So I, I definitely, uh, your, your answer resonated with me. Um, let me switch gears on the advice question for a minute and say, you know, one of our biggest initiatives at the USPTO is to try to increase the, the number of, of women and girls in STEM. And um, our own research has shown certainly that, that, that not enough women are involved and, and you know, we, need, we need as a country to be able to, to, to benefit from everyone involved in STEM. So what advice do you have for, the, for us, the USPTO, um, to, to be able to increase involvement in STEM? What, what can we do? Oh, this is a, this is a good question. Um, I don't know. Like, like I said, for me as a kid, I probably would have never just walked up to a, something that says STEM and, you know, been interested in it. Like I was just like, Oh, I, I like, I like the beach, you know, I've never been to Florida. You know, that was what, that was my entry point. Right. And so I always try to think um, like when I'm doing a STEM lecture, entry point for them like you know we try not to be too um you know gender gender specific on things but some girls like really like pink and princess right pink and princesses you know like that kind of thing like unicorns like just figure out like where the entry point is for different demographics um not all girls are into that um but yeah that's just what i would think about is um where uh where are their interests and try to meet them there Okay, great. And, and, you know, I mentioned that, that Kara and I came from a, a mentoring event and um, we were talking with, with others about comfort zone um, and, and being out of your comfort zone and being comfortable with being out of your comfort zone. Uh, do you feel like you're in your comfort zone? Do you feel like you're out of your comfort zone or, you know, just love to hear your thoughts because you do so many different things. Oh yeah. Um, I, I, that's an interesting topic about comfort zone. So I will tell you until I got to maybe my second year of college, I was a painfully shy person. Hard to believe. Right. <laughs> um, but it's actually, you know, thanks to, um, my roommate, my first roommate in college, her name is, uh, Bethany Smith. Hi, Bethany. Um, but she, uh, she, she was a very outgoing, loving person, big heart. And I just kind of learned like how not to be so introverted from her. Um, and so, but yeah, that took, so, took a while being out of my comfort zone and just learning to talk to people. Cause I really didn't do that much before, I guess. And so, um, but no, now I find myself, you know, it just really takes practice. And, um, actually I've had this discussion with, um, some of my friends, uh, recently about like how, like, yeah, like you can learn to be, um, an outgoing person if that's what you want to be. It's, um, just a matter of practice, a matter of just saying things and learning, you know, what comes out right, what does it, you know, sometimes you stick your, your foot in your mouth and sometimes it doesn't come out right. And, but what you'll, what you'll realize is like the people who are well-spoken have had a lot of practice and they've made a lot of mistakes. Um, and so anyway, for comfort zone for me goes back to the thought of like, I used to be really shy and not great at, you know, public speaking and stuff. And, but then just learning over the course of many years, how to, how to talk to people. Is it, is it so one of the things that stands out to me uh, about you is you love hands on right experience, but you're also a, a personality, whether it be on, on the web, on, on the TV. And, and so, uh, yeah, as an ambassador. So I, I assume from your answer, you're more out of your comfort zone in the public space. But is that true or is that changed? Like, are you now? That's changed. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm like super comfortable with it. I think, um, you know, like I said, you can 
I've, I've kind of learned over the years and uh, it really just, I'm, I'm really comfortable now because I love connecting with people. I love, you know, hopefully making people laugh or making people smile. I love having that kind of, um, you know, rapport and, and uh, experience and um, giving somebody, giving people something of value. You know, if I can teach somebody or tell somebody my experience in a way that, um, you know, brightens their day or, or helps them think about a problem that they're having in a different way or solves a problem, you know, that's, that's what I love to do. And so um, I'm totally in my comfort zone when I'm on camera. Actually, if I, if I have a minute, I can tell a story like me and my husband were um, auditioning for a reality show of, you know, four engineers, uh, couples. Okay, so engineering couples in this reality competition show. And um, I don't think he'd ever seen me like on camera live or I don't know, but we were on, you know, we, we were getting ready for the thing and we turned the camera on and they're asking questions. And then I turn on my, you know, camera personality and he just looks over like, who is this? And he just kind of like froze because he was not expecting that. And so um, anyway, yeah, I'm totally comfortable on the camera. <laughs> Well, that is a, it's a great story. Um, I, I think I'm going to push the envelope. We may have a minute left or a little less. So I just literally turned 235. I'm going to ask you one more question, if that's okay. Sorry, Sean. Um, I had it in my head, so I, I'd like to go there. But um, so you're on the cutting edge of, of 3D printing technology, which, which I think is wonderful. And, and, and we, I know we have a lot of engineers listening in. What would be your goal for where you see that technology in the future? Oh, yeah. So um, right now, 3D printing is pretty stuck in just kind of mostly single materials at a time. Like you you can kind of do like two, two or three materials if you wanted to, um, but it's not really high resolution. There's not great bonding between them. It's just it's not like a functional dual material um, technology. And so for me, my the vision for the future of 3D printing is when we can do multiple materials like engineering materials like ceramics and metals together and have them knitted, you know, using the 3D printing, 3D, 3D printer, um, such that they're structurally integrated, right? And so now we can get the best of both worlds. So ceramics are great in extreme environments. Metals are great when there's, you know, um, lots of um, uh, stress and strain. Um, and so, you know, combining those properties would just be really killer for a lot of applications, especially in energy generation. Great. Well, thank you so much. On behalf of the USPTO, I just want to thank you for being a part of our Women's Entrepreneurship Symposium. And, and it's just wonderful to, to, to see you being such a, a great role model and, and, and getting out of your comfort zone or making things that were out of your comfort zone into your comfort zone. So thank you so much. And I guess I will pass it back to Sean. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate your time today. What you're doing is fascinating. It's so cutting edge. And again, I am probably becoming your biggest fan as we do more research. So thank you, Drew, for your time. And thank you, Amy.